Hello there, my fellow Necromundans, and welcome back to some 40k lore. Today, from the gift which keeps on giving, which is the lore of Necromunda, I bring you a few stories about some infamous so-called house agents. These are similar to the bounty hunters from my previous Necromundan video, but are arguably feared even more because of their allegiance with one particular faction. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The first of today's famous house agents is none other than Margot Merdena, also known as the Dust Sea Road Boss and an agent of House Orlock. The seventh daughter of Slate Merdena, Margot runs the Dust Sea Road Cruise for Clan Orlock. Young for a Road Boss, still shy of her 30th Grand Cycle, at least when this story was written, she has nonetheless garnered a lot of respect from her peers for opening up the Dust Sea Road to Hive Rothgol. For years, the Dust Sea, the Dead Sea and the Dry Sea crews were at odds, their fractious gangs fighting for control of the vast wasteland off the western edge of the Palatine Plateau. And while they struggled, Ashways nomads, mutant packs, wasteland critters and other enemies raided the roads between Hive Primus and the Western Hive Clusters. Margot would change all that. In brutal succession, she bested a dozen Orlock gang bosses, uniting all of them under her control, and then launched a raid against the largest Ashways Nomad settlement in the Dead Sea. During this savage battle, a dust stalker tore off her legs, Margot killing the creature with her harpoon gun and using its coil to staunch the bleeding. For an hour she lay in a pool of her own blood, killing anything that was foolish enough to try to finish her. And afterwards she fashioned new legs from the wheel blades and the axle springs of the wrecked Ash Runner. And after that the rest of the gangs fell in line and her influence continued to spread. Margot moves incredibly fast for a woman with cyber augmented legs, often dashing across the ash in a blur of movement to hack somebody apart with an axe kick. To help get around on her rig, she created a gauntlet-mounted harpoon gun, firing a spear into the intended target and then dragging it, or herself, to where she needs to be. This comes in especially handy when boarding enemy vehicles, but no less so when it comes to climbing through the tangled ruin of the Underhive. Happy, Furiosa noises in the background. The second of today's characters is Ajax Gorgov, Lord of the Fist and an Alpha of House Goliath. The Fist of Hive Primus is the largest Goliath enclave on Necromunda, and Ajax Gorgoth is its master. One of the eight Alphas of Hive Primus, he serves over tyrant Varen Gore by ruling over the Manufactorum, the Slave Pits, and the fighting arenas and forges of the Fist. Unlike his counterparts in other clan houses, Ajax is far from just a bureaucrat or overseer, content to live his life counting quotas or gathering up tithe chits. The Lord of the Fist is a far more hands-on master, either fighting in the House of Pain, the biggest fighting pit in the Fist, or descending into the Underhive to expand the territories of the clan and gather slaves for the factories. Ajax's long and bloody history began in the forge pits of Vat City, gathering up a mold slag spilled out of the great weapon presses. An actual natborn, Ajax's cunning was apparent even then the future Alpha using the cast of metal to fashion his own weapons. And over the following years, he fought his way up to lead the Forge Lord's gang, augmenting his body with some homemade bionics and blades, including replacing his own nose when it was bitten off in a fight. His knockoff power armor is something he built himself, the weight far beyond what most normal fighters can ever hope to carry. Fed on dirty Prometheum, it emits clouds of greasy black smoke, but also gives his servo claw the strength to rip off an Ambot's head if required. Ajax eventually became the ruler of the Fist when he defeated its previous Alpha, whose skull he still has on a trophy rack fixed on his back. Varangor himself watches the career of Ajax with great interest, lest Gore's own skull also ends up adorning the Alpha's armor. Next we have another badass lady known as Tess Arkup. Tess is reckless even for a forgeborn Goliath. So reckless in fact that she has been a prospect for far longer than most, even the most savage Vatborn Goliath gangs finding her too dangerous to have around for too long. 
Somehow though, Tess survived every stupid thing she got herself into. Whether it is climbing the hive shell barehanded, her custom storm welder slung over her back and the ashen wind trying to snatch her away into oblivion, or tacking on whole gangs all by herself, charging into their ranks before letting loose with her weapon. Tess doesn't know why she is the way she is, although those who have fought alongside her and lived suspect it is the lightning in her blood. Tess's batch suffered a VAT malfunction during their gestation, a grid overload pumping hundreds of gigawatts of electricity into her amnio tank. Out of all her VAT brothers and sisters, Tess alone survived, and even from birth she displayed strange abilities. Quicker and more erratic than the other Goliaths, she quickly took to the role of a shell runner, climbing the sides of the hive and repairing its plasteel and ceramide skin, usually under the most horrific conditions. Her quick reactions and boundless energy kept her alive when many of her peers perished in a storm. The danger of the shell not enough for Tess, she soon started hiring herself to gangs for underhive brawls. Her skill with a storm welder and her fearlessness had made her respected by many gangs, although none have seen her to be fit to join. Tess is gathering a following on her own, however, and the day may yet come when she runs her own gang filled with prospects just like herself. The next one is not even a person, but a machine, known as the Arachnotech Golem. The Arachnotech Golem is a technological horror born from the deranged imagination of Archaeotech Sater Davos. It began its existence as a means of the Vanzar to cheat death. This was in the centuries before the clan perfected their environmental suits and Davos dabbled in full cybernetic bodies as replacements for the falling flesh of their people. It is said that the dead and dying Vanzar Archaeotechs were brought before the Golem, where they breathed their last upon its iron skin, and gave over their fading engrams to this mechanical man. The theory was that they would live on as ghosts in the machine spirit of the Golem, and the great minds of the Vanzar might somehow be preserved. But like so many things devised by the Archaeotechs, the Arachnotech Golem was both a great success and a great failure. Unfortunately for Davos and all that would come after him, the coding imprinted on the Golem would never find purchase, and the mind of the deceased would live on in the machine for a time before fading. This meant that more dead and dying had to be brought before it could enjoy some semblance of life again. Of course, even in this damaged state, the golem found a place in the clan. Centuries later, it is a tool of revenge. Its body was added to over the years to make a device of war, towering over all mortal hivers. Its armor torso aloft on spider legs and equipped with an arrangement of weapons created by some of the most powerful archaeotechs to have ever lived. Bold Vanzar gangs might petition for the services of the golem, by offering one or more of their brothers and sisters so the machine might absorb their engramic spirits for a time. Such a melding is not without risk, however, and can leave the donor as little more than a bithering idiot. Next we have one Clovis the Redeemer, an agent of House Kodor. The Redeemer is a legend among the people of Necromunda, a furious firebrand and a fanatical warrior whose devotion to the redemption is unmatched. Once upon a time he was a noble of Clan Kodor known as Lord Clovis, and enjoyed the wealth of a clan's upper class in Hive Primus. Some say he could have even taken the mantle of Fane should he have wanted it, but instead chose a different path. Casting off the trappings of nobility, the Redeemer set out into the Underhive to purge the unclean, and spread the word of redemption. It wasn't long before he had attracted a band of zealous followers, fighters drawn to the strength of his convictions and the brutal methods he favored. Deacon Malakev, a diminutive servo scribe, is perhaps the most famous of these. He follows the Redeemer on his crusades diligently recording his great deeds, as well as carrying the Liber Excruciatus, Clovis' infamous book of torture. A lifetime of bringing the righteous redemption to the outcasts and heretics of Necromunda has hardened the Redeemer against notions like pity or mercy, and those who face him know that they can expect no quarter from this zealous warrior. To further terrify his enemies, the Redeemer wears a flaming crown upon his head, its blazing fires spatting and sparking as his furious gaze burns into the enemy. 
His former wealth as a noble and his connections to the upper circle of House Kodor afford him weapons and war gear of exceptional quality. His crimson robes hide quilted mesh armor able to stop auto rounds and last blasts, while he favors well-maintained chain weapons like his custom eviscerator, also known as the Sword of Persecution. Rumor has it that he's even built a fortress somewhere in the Ashen Wastes, and has his own armored transport that he uses to purge the wilds of mutants, monsters and heretics. The greatest strength of the Redeemer, however, is not his considerable skill as a warrior or the unique weapons that he carries, but rather the strength of his faith. In many ways he is the embodiment of the Redemption, a pure expression of religious fury given form. Followers of Redemption fight harder under his gaze, just as the enemies of the faith quail in fear. A terror only reinforced by the Redeemer's methods for cleansing the souls of the unbelievers. As the Redeemer himself likes to say, if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't count. Next we have Necrana, the Revenant of Ceres. No one remembers this person's actual name. All those who knew her when she was alive have long since died, and Necrana herself barely ever spoke, if she spoke at all. Wrapped in stained and torn robes, this death maiden ancient is a nightmare given form to all the gangs of Hive Ceres and beyond. Years of battle have left their flesh pock with bullet wounds and scarred by blades, the punishment far more than anything living could survive. And yet, Necrana endures, her face slowly rotting away beneath her mask of stained bandages. While age has slowed Necrana's reactions, the embalming toxins filling her body had made her far more resilient to compensate. As her enemies will attest, the Death Maiden has risen from kill shots and supposedly fatal blows time and time again. There are those within the Morrigan who have argued that Necrana should be put to rest, it being well known that should the Death Maiden stop receiving her regular treatments, she will die for good. These other Death Maidens believe that to keep one of their own active for so long is an affront to the laws of the house and an act of extreme cruelty. The Ceres Skymis cult who minister to Necrana argue that she will continue to hunt for the clan willingly. What they haven't told anyone is that Necrana hasn't actually taken the elixirs in years. Another famous House Escher agent is Sinus, the mother of poisons. Out of all the primary witches, Mother Sinus is maybe the most respected and feared. She has a seat on the Council of Crones, and if it is to be believed, the ear of the matriarch herself. Sinus's power comes from her control of the Hive Primus Chymus cults and the primary Death Maidens. Old, even by the standards of the Council of Crones, she has maintained a youthful appearance through countless rejuvenate treatments, her timeless appearance concealing her extreme age. Despite having led the witches for almost two centuries, she still ventures out into the Underhive in search of promising candidates for the Death Maidens, or for rare ingredients for the potions. Given her importance and power, she usually travels in the company of a Death Maiden or with a loyal Escher gang. The benefits of helping out Sinus on one of the expeditions are the finest chems for the gang, sharpening their senses and increasing their reflexes far beyond what youth and muscle could possibly achieve. Sinus herself is not an easy target either. Beneath her clan chymist robe, she hides a wealth of poisons and chems to feed her wrist-mounted needle pistols. With a contemptuous nature, she can unleash a flurry of these dots, paralyzing, rendering unconscious, or even killing her foes. And should a blade or round find its way into Sinus's flesh, subdermal chem pumps stand ready to flood her system with stims and hypercoagulants, preserving her from harm. And finally for today, we have the Servant of the Silent Ones. The Servant is a creature built of memory, plasteel, and genetic scrap. It began as a collective dream experienced by the Star Chamber, dozens of powerful Dalak leaders feeling the will of the Psychoterica impressed down upon them. Like some sleeping giant trying to rise out of the depths, the Servant took shape from this dream much as the stalkers are shaped by the psychic talents of a whisperer into a tool for the clan. Unlike the Piscean and Cephalopod stalkers, however, the servant is not a mere animal guided by the mental commands of a controller. Rather, not long after its shell was created to match the vision of the star chamber, 
and a cultured cranial soup poured into its cortex, it became self-aware. Guided by ancient memory, some echoing down across the eons from the Silent Ones, others fresher, coming from its Piscean heritage, the Servant has become an effective tool for the Star Chamber in its plans to awaken the original Necromundans. Held aloft on a bundle of mechanical tendrils, the Servant can stand taller than an ogrim, or flatten itself out until it is only a few spans above the ground. The spherical jaws that make up its body and protect its brain are in constant motion, giving the appearance of some grim cross between an octopus and a shark. Not that most Necromundans will know what either of those things are. It can also move with surprising speed, using the bundles of its tendrils to run along dome ceilings or dash up ladders. In the service of the house, it can also be quite deadly. Its tendrils charge with electricity and its mouth able to emit a stunning wail. And this, my fellow outlandish house agents, has been what I wanted to tell you about these Necromundan characters for today. Call me predictable by now, but my favorites today are the Aragnotech Golem and the Servant of the Silent Ones. I always tend to gravitate towards the mysterious things in many situations. You, however, might like something else, which is why you are free to share your thoughts and opinions on this cast of characters in the comments below. If you found this informative, do consider leaving a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon for future content. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and I wish you all a healthy and awesome day. The Emperor protects.